Good evening. My name is Chase Robinson. I'm the president of the Graduate Center, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to tonight's presentation. We are delighted tonight to feature our own Morris Dickstein, well known to the public as a literary critic and a cultural historian, well known to those of us who have the privilege of working at the Graduate Center as a longtime member of our faculty, an admired colleague, and a good friend. Morris will discuss his new memoir, Why Not Say What Happened? And he'll do so with Gary Giddens himself, an acclaimed critic, author, and director of our own Leon Levy Center for Biography, one of the co-sponsors of tonight's event. The Center for the Humanities, another co-sponsor, as it happens, was founded by Morris himself in 1993. Now, many of you will know that the Graduate Center is a graduate school of arts and sciences. It's a center for applied and theoretical research. And it's also a platform for performance, conversation, and public debate. As a community of students and scholars committed to the idea that learning is a public good, we regularly offer public programs that feature eminent thinkers, writers, artists, and cultural leaders. Throughout his career, Morris has certainly been that. He has embodied the role of the public intellectual, focusing his critic's sharp eye, not only on the literary canon, but on film, popular music, and politics, sharing his insights with both scholars and general readers in lively and penetrating prose. His latest book, he examines a subject that's fairly close to home, his own life and his own early times. The result is a personal and cultural memoir of coming of age in mid-century America, the title of this evening's discussion. The New Yorker recently described the book as a love letter to those years, noting Dickstein reveals himself to be in sync with his times. Morris is distinguished professor emeritus of English and theater. He's the author of Dancing in the Dark, A Cultural History of the Great Depression, Leopards in the Temple, The Transformation of American Fiction, 1945 to 1970, and Gates of Eden, American Culture in the 60s, among many other books. Formerly a contributing editor of Partisan Review, he's written exclusive, extensively for the New York Times Book Review, The Times Literary Supplement, The Nation, and many other publications. Gary Giddens, a frequent presence on this stage, was the Village Voice jazz columnist for over 30 years. He's the winner of the National Book Circle, Critics Circle Award for Visions of Jazz, the first century, as well as the Ralph J. Gleason Music Book Award for Visions of Jazz, and also for Bing Crosby, A Pocketful of Dreams, The Early Years. His other books include Weatherbird, Jazz at the Dawn of the Second Century, Warning Shadows, Home Alone with Classic Cinema, and biographies of Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you, Chase. Uh, this is delightful, Morris. I'm so glad we could finally do this. I'm going to begin by quoting something that you wrote a few years ago. You were reviewing a memoir by a friend of yours, Jeffrey Hartman. You begin, politicians, captains of industry, and media celebrities write memoirs or talk them out to actual writers in the belief shared by publishers that people are interested in the private lives of public figures, the story behind great success or notoriety. Others write therapeutic or voyeuristic memoirs that read like guided tours through hell, cautionary tales of failure, dysfunction, and in some cases, stirring recovery, holding out hope for us all. You were not abused as a child and you're not running for president, so why a memoir? <laughs> Well, I, I realize that I'm on, under several disabilities, <laughs> uh, but uh, I wrote a memoir simply because, first of all, I had taken a fair number of, a fair amount of time on my previous book, and, and which required a lot of research. Uh, 
And almost hedonistically, I wanted to do something that involved no research or a little research or simply research into my own mind. And I had, you know, uh, a, a fiction writer will say, this is my life, this is my material. And I felt, in a way, this is my material. I wanted to, in a way, settle my, some scores with it. I wanted to, uh, some of the book are, memory, are, are stories that I've told again and again for a long time. Other things are things that I only remembered when I began to work on it. And, uh, and, and things began pouring out. So uh, as I say in the book, I've always had a kind of fascinating relation to the past. I've always felt, I mean, even before I had any experience under my belt, I already had nostalgia for past times. Uh, in my 20s, I thought, oh, those, those earlier years were so wonderful. And, and, uh, and when I was doing it, I found that, of course, the years were not always wonderful. Some of the years were rather unhappy. And, but that too uh, was was interesting to revisit, and uh, so the challenge was to make things that strongly interested me uh, to tell them in a way that would interest other people as well. And I hope I've done so. Let's begin with the title. Uh, the, the The first part of the title, "Why Not Say What Happened," uh, comes from uh, Robert Lowell's LG, I think. The t that title was used by Lowell's daughter a few years ago. Did that? Well, the curious thing is I'd actually read that book, and I had liked it, and I didn't remember the title. And it was only rather late that I, just, that I realized that I had, that Ivana Lowell, who perhaps has a somewhat greater claim on Robert Lowell's work, <laughs> uh, had used that title. Mine is a little different because she kept his question mark, ah. and I removed the question mark so that I would say, why not say what happened, rather than why not, you know? So, so it's a little different, but it, it seemed appropriate. I mean, in a way, it's a bit of a tautology. Why not say what happened is you can translate that, that as memoir, right? But, but, but it, 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 it somehow, I, I was looking for something prosaic, actually, uh, like what people talk about when they talk about love. And this was the best equivalent that I could find. It's a great title. My favorite fake memoir title is uh, My Life in Hard Times, which, which <laughs> becomes funny with Thurber. Well, uh, that's funny because when, as I was, when I was looking for a title, um, my, my uh, uh, eight-year-old grandson heard that I was looking for a title, and he's very precocious. And uh, he said, well, Grandpa, uh, why not call it My Life? <laughs> I said, Simon, that's an excellent idea, but it's, it's too broad, it's too general. And he thought for a moment and he said, well, what about my life in detail? <laughs> and basically, that's what I did. <laughs> right. Now, the second part of the title is a sentimental education, and this is a nod to Flaubert. Uh, what did that mean to you? Well, I mean, I you're putting yourself in rarefied company. Uh, I had originally thought that this would be primarily a family memoir. And uh, as I went on, I realized that it was more and more about education, but education in a number of different senses. And I felt the sentimental education uh, covered both formal education and also the growth of the life of feeling and understanding and one's relation to one's own experience. And, and I mean, there, there, there is a kind of problem there in the sense that when Flaubert used that title, he meant it rather ironically. Uh, because he, when you look closely at the book, it's about people who have gone through their lives learning essentially nothing. And so in a way, there was something about it that was part of a kind of wonderment. What did I really learn in the course of this, these experiences that I've described? But I, I think I, I primarily meant it in the in the broad sense of education rather than the narrow one. When, when you, uh, I, I, did you write it chronologically? Because the book is organized in a non-chronological No, I mean, uh, it actually began with the memory I describe in the prologue, the memory of, of, of going back to the apartment that I'd lived in a few years earlier and wandering into somebody else's apartment even though I, there was nobody home and, uh, and to, uh, 
express the kind of fascination I had with recapturing earlier experiences. And that automa almost automatically led to the memory of the period in which that occurred. And then I went back and did it more chronologically after that chapter. So you, you, the book actually begins at Yale. It was written in exactly that sequence, yeah. Yeah. Um, you describe, since the book begins there, let me just, Yale is the one place that uh, really gives you pause. You describe it as a desiccated damning, the one part of your education for which you have little affection. You refer to its industrial approach designed to replace the vagaries of inspiration with professional versatility, and elsewhere to, to promote facility rather than thinking. Very different from your experience at Columbia. Um, and so the, the idea of beginning there, I think, sets up a, a kind of drama that and otherwise, uh, for the most part, you lead a charmed life. Well, a lot of that is about teaching. Uh, I had an unusual undergraduate experience in that at Columbia, uh, unusual for the Ivy League especially, there was a, which, uh, where the usual emphasis is on research, in the undergraduate, rather small undergraduate division, then much smaller undergraduate division at Columbia, there was a real teaching ethos that I think is quite different from, say, Harvard or Yale undergraduate. In other words, their, their core, famous core courses, which are taught in small sections, which is unusual, for a university where introductory courses are often large lecture classes with sections. And I think that faculty, um, again, unusual for a research university, were really rewarded for good teaching. And I had extraordinary amount of good teaching. I made the mistake of expecting that at the graduate level as well. And the graduate level, there was almost no teaching to speak of. It was all, you know, you, professional, chores and learning certain forms of professional responsibility. Most of my classes involved students reading aloud their papers with then kind of desultory comments by other students in the class. And so I, I in a way, my disappointment there was partly that I, I, uh, I brought the wrong expectations to graduate work. And I mean, in retrospect, I mean, uh, I learned a great deal there. Uh, and I was there at the cusp of a new generation coming into the faculty. I did my courses with an older generation of faculty, but by the time I finished my classwork, people like Harold Blumen had arrived as junior faculty. And I was it's, able to- It's remarkable. Anyone who majored in English as I did in the later 60s, uh, I don't think you could have a syllabus in which half your teachers weren't represented. It's just unbelievable. It begin, in Yale, you have uh, Cleanth Brooks, Charles Fiedelson, R. W. B. Lewis, and then the newcomer who actually is, reads your dissertation is Harold Bloom. Uh, and yet, one of the amazing stories in this uh, book, to, to me, is when you're doing your orals, and the question is, can you name Shakespeare's history plays? Well, and your response is, name? Name, <laughs> right, yeah. Well, the, I think this, this has to do with changes that occurred during that period in the study of literature. Uh, this was a period, I mean, uh, as the professional study of literature in much of the 20th century did not involve actual literary criticism. It involved various forms of literary scholarship, establishing texts, annotating them, and so on, that the spirit of the new criticism of close reading and so on had just then begun to infiltrate into, graduate, into, into the graduate study of literature. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to sort of hook into uh, some, some of the new people that were arriving on the scene uh, uh, who, who represent what criticism has come to represent today. Uh, uh, you know, so, so again, I had the wrong expectations. I didn't want to be trained as a scholar, though I was in the end. Uh, in the end, it did happen. Uh, but it, it was, uh, you know, I could easily have dropped out and gone into literary journalism. That would have been, that happened to some of my classmates who also had the wrong expectations and were unhappy there. I sort of persisted by being able to work with people like Harold Bloom who were sympathetic to what I wanted to do.
who also resisted the whole movement towards uh, deconstruction and symbiotics and, and the whole French school. Um, you, you actually are something of a, a beacon in the, for me in the 70s and 80s as somebody who was writing in a more traditional way um, and not giving in to those. Well, some of that had to do with coming to teach in New York after graduate school. And if I had stayed, if I had gone from Yale to a university town, if I'd gone to Ann Arbor, if I'd gone to Madison, Wisconsin, uh, then I suspect that my peer world would have been the academic world of the study of literature. And therefore, and then most probably I would have gotten more in tune with the arrival of French literary theory and so on. But coming to New York, uh, the people that uh, I was meeting in New York were the people that I was going to write for. It was, it was, a, more, it was a broader audience. I mean, uh, Chase kindly mentioned the, uh, the Center for the Humanities, and, and part of our original idea for the Center for the Humanities was precisely to draw, to build bridges between the academic world and the, 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 the intelligent general readership. And it just became both a reflex and the, the, the stuff that really interested me to be able to write to a broader audience than simply fellow scholars of English romantic poetry. Uh, and, you know, and also I felt that that would involve real writing rather than a, a, the kind of mechanical application of theory. And, and I was always drawn to be able to actually write rather than simply to anatomize texts or things like that. Did you run into resentment uh, at the academic level when people started to see your byline in the Times Book Review and other popular publications? I wasn't aware of any resentment, but you know, I was teaching at Queens College and uh, at one point a colleague who was a close friend said, to me, I mean, we were having an argument about something and he got very exasperated. And he said, you know, not everyone in the department really likes you. <laughs> and I said, why not? <laughs> like, what have I done? <laughs> and it's possible there that, that people felt that I was representing the department, un unconsciously representing the department in, a wrong, in the wrong way. That I was giving a kind of journalistic image of the department. But, I don't know, maybe it was just personality they didn't, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I didn't, especially, you know, when I came to the Graduate Center, it was very clear that students had their own radar so that the students who had come to work with me here were coming to work with me because they were interested in writing, do, doing a certain kind of scholarship, a certain kind of writing. They weren't coming to me for things. That they came to other people for other things. That, uh, very few would come to me for theory because it's not, theory is not something that I was that interested in doing. And so uh, what happened was here especially that instead of culture wars, relatively speaking, we had 100 flowers blooming and, and students came and plucked those flowers that interested them. Going back to the, the process of writing a memoir, um, I, 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 one can't help but note that you treat different people in different ways. For example, your friend Richard Locke is named Richard Locke, but Marshall Berman is only Marshall. And your wife, who is the, really the second lead character in the book, uh, is always referred to as L. And why did you make those decisions? I never thought the publisher would let me get away with it, <laughs> that, honestly. It, I'm sorry. I, I never thought, I mean, it, it wrote itself that way and I never thought that the publisher, Liverite, wonder, my wonderful editor, Bob Weil, I never thought they'd let me get away with that variation in how I referred to people. And I think it was probably, I probably did it, in the case of L, though everyone who knew us would know who L was, uh, in order to write the book, I mean, it's hard to write the story that partly the story of someone who was and remains your spouse. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do in a memoir. And I felt that using the initial helped me write it because it gave her more of a shadow presence in the book rather than 
actual presence as a full character. And that was facilitated the writing. I was perfectly prepared to, for someone to say, you just can't get away with this because you refer to somebody by their full name. They were perfectly happy with it. Uh, in the case of some friends, I mean, I tried to etch brief portraits of my college friends. And in order to give a, um, uh, a lively uh, portrait of someone that has impact, you have to edge it. And the, edge, the edges on the portraits, the brief as they were, were things that I felt that those people might be offended by or upset by or might not, they might not want to go public in quite that way. And so while some people would know who Marshall was, uh, other uh, for other people, Marshall would just be Marshall. And so I felt that I was to some degree preserving their privacy in the same way that I referred to my, psycho my analyst as Dr. R. Uh, you know, I'm, there are probably people in the psychoanalytic world that can figure out who Dr. R was, but I just didn't want to splash Dr. R's actual name all over the book. Did you so, check with uh, friends and teachers or tell them that you were writing a memoir or show yeah, them? Yeah, I told them I was writing a memoir, but I didn't. In one case, with a chapter about travels, uh, the friend that I travel with, I, I sent him the chapter to make sure that I had it right and that he wasn't upset by it. But in most cases, no one seemed concerned about what I might write with them. Maybe they thought on, they thought it was unlikely that it's going to be a pathography that you know, is going to show them in a very bad light. But I felt that uh, the, kind of de the kind of descriptions that I was giving uh, of people I think they needed a little bit of protection, and I tried to give them that protection. And it was almost unconscious. I didn't think of it. It just, for certain people, it came out right to use their names, and for certain people, it felt right not to. Far from uh, being a pathography, uh, this is one of those rare memoirs about a happy childhood. And one of the charming things about the book is that even though you break away from the orthodoxies of the Judaism that you were raised with, and I'm you talk about putting on the tefillin and leading rabbinical services, and uh, I thought well, it was amusing. At one point, you're known at Columbia University as Marty, but working in the Catskills, you're Moisha. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, th there is a charm about that, that you, that you uh, despite the fact that you leave certain orthodoxies, you're, you remain fond of the, of the, the prayers, the music, the, the cultural aspect, and that comes through as a sort of constant throughout the book. Well, you know, it was a challenge. We all know that it's very, very hard. Uh, you know that, you know, Graham Greene said, that an unhappy childhood is a writer's capital for life. And by that, by that score, a happy one, or a relatively happy one, is difficult, or would be difficult to make interesting. Uh, I mean, happy families are all alike, said Tolstoy, and therefore either no one writes novels about them or there's only one novel to be written about them. Uh, in this case, I was pleased that certainly after that point, there was a fair amount of unhappiness, neurosis, conflict, <laughs> psychosomatic ailments. I mean, uh, uh, I, mean I, I definitely needed an admixture of unhappiness to give the book some texture, and I think I found it. <laughs> well, the, 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 uh, the two family members who don't come off particularly well in the book are your in-laws. It sounds almost like a cliche, <laughs> but uh, did, did you... Uh, Consult with L about that. Uh, I, I won't tell you what her reaction was. I did consult with her about it. Uh, but she was okay with it. <laughs> uh, you, at one point, you say that your duty as a child was to carry on the Jewish life they had compromised. They felt that. I didn't feel that. Right. Yeah. My parents felt that insofar as they had departed from Orthodox, Orthodox Judaism for whatever economic reason or necessity, that I had to carry it on. And uh, uh, this was not, you know, for a long time people thought I was going to be a rabbi, and I never considered being a rabbi, but they just thought this is the direction that I seem to be going. Uh, and I 
fairly quickly headed off in another direction. But I, I remained, uh, it's curious, compared to other people who had Orthodox Judaism or Orthodox religion of any sort, foisted it upon them in a harsh way, I think that it, it was a recipe for a certain kind of rebellion and rejection. And in my case, it was pressed upon me largely in a benign and loving way. And therefore, even after I broke away, I had a fondness for it, even apart from the fondness for the past that, I've descri that, that I described earlier. And so I think that I was able to break away and rebel and at the same time, you know, keep a corner in my heart for the things that had been meaningful and beautiful to me about a world that I had essentially left behind. There's a very vivid moment uh, when you and uh, Laurie are in Europe and she orders a French cold cut sandwich and you're, 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 you appear to be looking at her as though you're waiting for some kind of mosaic uh, retribution. <laughs> <laughs> what I was actually doing at the time was keeping as straight and neutral a face as I possibly could that I I was not going to be in the position of making any judgment of what she felt she had to do. And uh, I probably failed <laughs> to be non-judgmental, but I tried. <laughs> well, her spirit and independence is, uh, is sort of a, a counterweight to a lot of the agonizing you're going through about this. Well, I mean, I think that some of the independence that I hope I developed was, were, was something that I learned from her. that that. Uh, if I was a little too much the model of the good child, she had, I think, a certain amount of more gumption in various ways. And it, I, I, think, I think that from early on, she taught me lessons in, in independence that were very valuable in life. One line I have to single out because uh, it brought back a memory from my childhood, which was whenever I walked in front of the television, my father would say, is your father at Glacier? And I never knew what the hell that was about. <laughs> and you, you bring that line and right. say, in your in case, your father really was a Glacier. But why was that considered funny? Well, it's like, you think I can see through you, you know? Well, I understand the meaning right. of it, but that's, I didn't realize that the line was sort of widely known yes, among yes. Jews of a certain generation. I, 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 you're the first person I've ever met who's remembered that line. But it was, it was reasonably common at the time. The book is uh, structured as a, as a journey in the, it, for a long uh, part of it anyway, from Henry Street to, through Flushing to Morningside Heights. Um, and when you get to, uh, when you get to Columbia, uh, there were marvelous anecdotes about the, the professors, again, this all-star group. Um, I'd like to sort of develop those portraits and maybe add, add to them uh, here. Uh, one of them, of course, is Lionel Trilling. And uh, Trilling ends up, uh, I, there's some amb amb ambivalence about Trilling because he, he keeps your dissertation on his desk about your book about Keats, refuses to give it back and refuses to read it. Well, this was way later than, than my studying with him. Right. Yeah. This was when you're in a, dis a difficult situation of being a colleague of one of your former teachers in a fairly hierarchical situation. There was a, a, a general strain of all there anyway, so. Okay, going back a, a, before that, Peter Gay. Uh, I didn't quite get that. Peter Gay, you, you were late handing in a paper and he could not forgive that. You said he was vindictive. Well, Peter, was, and I'm sure it still is, a uh, very German. And, uh, and it was important, I suppose it was important for him not only to do a wonderful paper, or at least the best you could do, but also to be punctual and hand it in on time. And this was not, this was significant, but not a major part of the ethos of me and my friends, especially in our last semester of college when we were ready to take off. And, uh, and uh, I, fortunately or not, I had parents who were permissive and forgiving and about as far from being 
German or German Jews, as you can imagine. And um, so I, I suppose it was helpful to me to encounter someone who put an emphasis on that kind of professional responsibility. Uh, were you reading the professors that you had at the time? Were you, were you going back to Trilling's work? And, yes. And yeah. I mean, or I was taking people whom I already had begun to read. I had read Trilling before I took his course. And, uh, and since he was not really a wonderful teacher, especially in a lecture course, I was really learning more from reading him at the time than from studying with him. His classes were very hit or miss. Could you describe that a little bit? You, you say that he sort of waited for a spark. And uh, if he didn't get the spark? Well, I'm sure he prepared for classes, but he gave the impression of coming in waiting for a spontaneous existential experience. And sometimes he would just throw something out and free associate. And the one class that I described that, well, that I remember is that a class that he gave on Kafka's trial, which is a very powerful book. And he, and he said, he comes in and, and he talks about how, you know, he didn't know, what, he didn't know what to say about Kafka's trial. You know, he didn't know what he could say that would be up to the magnitude or the challenge of the book. And then he talks about going around the fourth floor of Hamilton Hall and asking each of his colleagues, one more brilliant than the next, uh, what he could say an hour from now in, on Kafka's trial. And he describes each of them giving him the equivalent of a brilliant lecture on Kafka's trial. And he feels each one, well, yes, that's quite good, but not quite what I wanted to say. And he goes on and on and on. And then the class ended. <laughs> and it turned out to be a class on how difficult it is to talk about Kafka's trial if you're trying not simply to give a reading of Kafka's trial, but to meet the exigency of a particular modern literary work. And so that was one occasion when, for all I know, he may have planned to do that all along, but it seemed like a spontaneous occasion that, that ended up with an unexpected lesson. Now, in, other, in cases of other classes, it never really gelled in that way, and so uh, I can't say that he was an inspired teacher, but he had his wonderful moments. Who were the critics that you were reading who you think helped to form the direction you were going? You, you, is Kazin is there, Irving Howe, uh, I mean, in terms of publishing at that point. Uh, Bloom has just come, come along. Uh, you, you've worked with a lot of the, the classic English departments, uh, first at Yale, uh, first at Columbia, then at Yale. Were there any that you, you thought? Uh... Well, I wasn't really, as an undergraduate, I wasn't really reading much criticism. Uh, the, uh, certainly at Columbia, the emphasis was not on critical scholarship, but on, as with Trilling, confronting the text directly. It was not a huge emphasis on close reading, but that was primarily it. Close reading in relation to society, in relation to ideas, and so on. So one of the, the, the things that I do remember reading as an undergraduate that I found illuminating was a book that was very un-Columbia book, the, the book of essays by Cleanth Brooks called The Well-Wrought Urn, which is essentially a close readings of uh, extraordinarily important English poems, uh, including poems by Keats. And uh, I found that uh, reading carefully and closely and explaining or evolving or reenacting your reading was something that I, that I liked to do and I was fairly good at doing. And so, I mean, I, I was reading Trilling almost as a model of style because his writing was so conversational and so accessible. Uh, and then I was reading someone like Cleanth Brooks uh, as a way of, uh, as, a, as a new way of analyzing texts that had never really crossed my mind though I could see that my teachers were doing that. Uh, but other criti critics that I read, whom I later came to admire, like F.R. Levis, when I first read them, I thought, oh, no, this is not for me at all. You, you in Double Agent, you describe uh, uh, Trilling as, uh, uh, you say, you point out that Trilling uh, conceived of all criticism as autobiography. 
And uh, I have to say that because so much of this book deals with the 60s, in a way it was like reading Garden of Eden, but from a different perspective without, mm. without the mask of, of critical uh, scholarly or objectivity. It's well, the, the, though I, except for a few essays, I hadn't written uh, directly any kind of direct memoir before, but in retrospect, I, f I think that a lot of what I wrote as criticism or as cultural history had a personal dimension, and there was always some personal pressure, either, I think, shaping the voice or peeking through, you know, directly, I, you know, I recall, you know, uh, more than 40 years ago, re reviewing a Bernard Malamud novel on the front page of the Times Book Review and putting in something about my father and his difficulty with his store and how it, I felt it had eaten up his life and so on. And so, uh, I, I, you know, uh, I, I think the criticism, to say that criticism is autobiographical or personal, I think it could mean simply that you're shaping it around your own sensibility and your reaction, but it also could mean that you, that personal details, essayistic details, are relevant to what otherwise might seem to be sort of objective readings, you know, but of course always quite subjective. You, you mentioned F.R. Levis, and I want to talk about him for a bit, um, because I've gone back to read Levis, whom I had really not thought much about since the 1970s. I remember him as being, as you describe him, cantankerous and pugnacious. Aldous Huxley called him violent and ill-tempered. Uh, and there is, I think, moments for me where he seems downright, downright pathological. Um, he loves uh, the morality of literature and, and, and of society. He's not, just not too crazy about the people in it. And uh, uh, what I did not remember until I was rereading him now is, and this is I, related to, I think, autobiography in not particularly uh, advantageous, advantageous way, is how narcissistic he is. The, uh, uh, there's one preface he wrote where it, every single paragraph begins either with I or let me say. He begins uh, even the great tradition by, with an argument with somebody uh, that he's, he's writing against. And then after a brilliant close reading of Daniel Deronda, he goes off the wall on somebody that nobody's ever heard of for daring to say that Thomas Hardy is a greater writer than mm -hmm. Eliot. Without the, the fight, the fisticuffs, the, the, just the verbal slaughter, he seems to be uh, unmoored in some way as a critic. That's funny. I never thought of him that way. I, I, it's true that... Uh, he needed to play off people, and he was like a born controversialist, and eventually became quite paranoid about the way he was treated in Cambridge and in English literary culture. Uh, but what, what interested me most about him was a kind of rigor of attention that he had. Uh, one of the things that he did, when I came to Cambridge in 1963, he had actually retired a year earlier, and he retired with this bitterness that he had not been, never given a professorship there, uh, and that not, he claimed that none of his students had ever gotten jobs in the University of Cambridge. They had sort of been blackballed. And, but in fact, one of his students had actually, was actually a fellow of the college, Clare College, that I was in. And, uh, Is this Newton? John, John Newton? Newton, yeah. And, uh, and Newton, uh, uh, to prepare students in English, at Clare for their exams, had gotten Levis to come and do these informal sessions with them. And so uh, I, was, I was able to join a group of three or four or five undergraduates who were preparing for their exams. I wasn't preparing for anything, but I was just getting a very intimate dose of Levis every week. And uh, what, what struck me was the, uh, first of all, he had a different notion of close reading than the one that I had encountered in Cleath Brooks or in America. There, that, that usually involved explication, you know, analyzing themes in a work and how they're put together. And in Levis's approach, it was very different. He was much more interested in the kind of book it was, the style. In fact, he, one of the reasons that he was so good at training undergraduates was that uh, 
He had written a thesis on the development of English prose style many years earlier in the 20s and had never been published. And he, his way of teaching was to come in with a pile of passages that he'd culled from literary works and to try to show everything about the work purely from the linguistic elements in it, from the style. The kind of thing that we associate with one of the great, really great works of 20th century criticism, Eric Auerbach's Mimesis, where he gives you a historical development of Western literature entirely through the style of individual paragraphs that he analyzes in each chapter. And Liebes was able to do this. He was able to show just from internal evidence that, that this is something that was written in the uh, in late 18th century or in the late 17th century, just by the way the prose develops. You know. It's something that's often done with music. Really? But not with literature. Yeah. And so this was, a, this, was a, an, this was illuminating to me. And, uh, but the curious thing is that he also did that about any formulation he made. I mean, the, you know, uh, I tell in the book the story of uh, his wife was much more ready, readily, easy, ready to fly off the handle. Queenie. Queenie Levis. And, uh, you know, I tell the story of how at this final reception that he gave for our little group, uh, she was telling stories about Wittgenstein and... Uh, well, first and, she, if I could just interrupt, sure. first she starts going on about what a thug Jay Gatsby yeah, is. Right. She, he said, she said about the great Gatsby, and I'd only just read the great Gatsby a couple of months earlier. Uh, she said, oh Gatsby, Gatsby, as far as we're concerned, she said, he's just a thug, just a thug. And I went into this kind of helpless attempt <laughs> to, to defend the great, the, the great Gatsby and Gatsby as a character. Uh, and then she began to talk about Wittgenstein. I would never have dreamed that F.R. Levis, who was literary down to his fingertips, had been very, very close personally to Wittgenstein in the Cambridge in the late 20s and early 30s. And, uh, and, and Queenie, Mrs. Levis, obviously disapproved. And, for, for her, Wittgenstein was a little bit like Gatsby, you know, she was saying, and she was saying, oh, he's a terrible, terrible man, he terrorized his friends, and, and he did awful things, and, you know, and she said, he was quite mad, quite, quite mad. And after she made one of these sweeping formulations, uh, she would turn to him, and he was very taciturn, she would turn to him and say, isn't it so dear? And he never wanted to get into that stuff, and he would just sort of like sagely nod, you know, and he was like, like, yes, you know. I, and, but in this case, what she said about Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein was so sweeping that she demanded actual verbal assent from him. And, she, and when he wouldn't answer, she kept saying, isn't that so, dear? And finally, he had to speak. And what he said was, so typical of his criticism, he said, well, uh, to say that he was sane <laughs> would certainly be a false emphasis. <laughs> and she acted as if he'd simply agreed with her. She said, yes, 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 just so. And I thought, now that's the difference between them. She is willing to brilliantly fly off all sorts of handles, and he was waiting and he needed a formulation that was so qualified and so textured, so Jamesian, that, that it, it, would, it, would, it would account for what was being demanded of him, but also account for his reservations about the question. And you know, that, you know, I, I really felt that I learned something from, uh, from hearing him and from seeing him and uh, watching him read passages. Knowing so many of the great critics of the 20th century and, and studying with them and working with them in some, in some instances, um, I'm sure you've given thought to um, the viciousness. I mean, why are critics more willing to peel the bark off each other than almost any other group? I, I don't think that's true, actually. Well, I'm thinking of Leave Us on Snow, uh, Hi, uh, Edgar um, Hyman, what's his name? Stanley Edgar Hyman. Stanley Edgar Hyman Edmund on Wilson. Uh, Edmund Wilson. Right. I think those are relatively rare. I mean, I, I don't think that Levis, 
actually ever wrote anything like that snow attack. You know, I mean, he did, a, he did often attack people, but I don't think, you know, if you've ever been to the professional meetings of philosophers, where they tear into each other mercilessly from beginning to end, I mean, literary meetings are very benign by comparison. Uh, they, you know, they, you know, they compliment each other in the course of, un, you know, trying to undo it. You know, I, I just don't, I, I don't really. When, you, when your Keats book uh, came out, you, you, you point out in the book that you got a good review here and, and one that you didn't quite get the agenda of uh, Helen Vendler. So I looked up her review. And uh, it's, it was a long time ago, so I hope it doesn't, uh, 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 still painful, but I thought it was almost hilariously um, condescending and irrelevant. I mean, she actually begins the review by saying she went to the index to see what you had to say about her favorite poems. Right. And, and uh, since you clearly didn't uh, understand those poems, she, fought, she, she sort of conceded that she would have to actually read the book. And at which point, uh, then she begins to say what your thesis is, and she says, but we all knew that. And then goes off into a whole other direction. And the, the, uh, she's, she's brilliant in many ways, but there is a quality in her work where you do get the feeling that she owns poetry and that you step into her world at your peril. Thank you, Gary, for reminding me of my bad reviews. <laughs> 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 well, I think, Helen Bendler is unusual. She's definitely not my favorite critic. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, one of the things that I learned from Levis that was unusual in America was actually the importance of critical judgment in literary criticism. Now, we, we understand that in book reviews, there's usually a judgment, and a, you know, not necessarily just an up, thumbs up, thumbs down. But, literary, but in literary scholarship, very often evaluation, value judgments about the work under consideration are often quite rare. I mean, usually it's this close reading and this literary analysis. And from early on in graduate school, I felt that that's not sufficient, that you have to really stand and deliver as to what part of the work works and what part doesn't work. And, and it can't just be subjective, you also have to provide some evidence for your argument. This was not typical of American literary scholarship, and it never has been. Uh, in Levis and in English, uh, English literary criticism, literary judgment is more important, and I've always really felt sided with the English in that, in that, in that argument. Uh, uh, I, it, it makes no sense to me to do a critical analysis that gives equal weight to the parts of the book that fail and to the parts of the book that really are realized and crystallized. And that, one of the things that I most learned from Levis is it's not just the author's intentions that matter, it's how well they're actually realized in the work. And that inevitably is to a degree a subjective judgment, but that's crucial to any literary understanding. And so, the, even though I was, I've been sometimes at the receiving end, the polemical aspect of literary criticism to me is inseparable from true criticism. And, and as someone who for so many years has done wonderful literary critical journalism, you must, I think you must feel the same way. I do, of course, if you're not going to come out. I mean, it, it, you, you get the impression that the review you wrote of uh, Nabokov's last big novel was sort of a, a, a breakthrough for you in a way. And I think you're proud of the fact that you're the one, the, the only critic at the time we sort of called it as a, yeah. as a, as a failed work. Well, yeah, I mean, I think around, you know, this is the book, uh, this big book that he wrote after Lolita called Ada, which, uh, or Ada, which I, you know, I, I opened up with great excitement and enthusiasm, and it was a great opportunity to do it for the New Republic, and I was just, disappointed from the first page to the last. And of course I felt, well, I'm gonna say so. And that it turned out to be the only negative review the book got. I mean, I, as I say, within a couple of years, everybody thought that the whole thing was a white elephant and that, that it was a disaster. But at that moment, people were so awed by his reputation that no one would say so. And uh, 
you have to be 29 years old as I was at the time to be oh. willing to say, you know, the emperor has no clothes. You know? I, I wrote things at that age that I can't believe uh, now and would, probably wouldn't be able to do now. Uh, but it, it's still, I, I want to go back a little bit to, the, to this sort of, uh, the, the way critics uh, get on each other's nerves about tiny things. Uh, it's almost impossible if you ask almost any critic I know, what do you think of this other critic? The first thing they will say is, well, I don't always agree with him. And I'm like, well, of course you don't always. If you always agreed with him, you would be him. This goes without saying. Trilling, in the piece that he wrote about Edmund Wilson in the 1950s, he begins the piece talking about how well, you know he met Wilson at 35 and he was completely in awe of him and he's he's uh, this sort of young man wandering through the village in awe of Edmund Wilson so much wanting to write for him and now he's a man of substance in the 1950s and he's he wants to praise Wilson and he begins by saying of course he was often wrong he he singles out a Wordsworth poem that Wilson didn't like and Trilling says, this is actually one of Wordsworth's great poems. Two or three, why even go there? He's talking about a 700-page book, The Shores of Light, of which about 680 pages he appears to approve of. So what is that about? And I, I see it in every field of criticism. It's certainly there in jazz. It's in film. We, we, we remember the... Uh, the, the ardent bloodletting in the 60s between Andrew Saris and Pauline Kael and John Simon. It just does seem to be this question that if you dare to see this film or read this poem differently than me, you're an idiot. Well, but that, but that well, if we don't have that today, it's because things don't matter as much. That shows that things really matter. I mean, some of it is just the critic trying to carve a space for his or her, him or herself. Some of it uh, is, uh, you know, well, you know, the fact that Trilling says that Wilson, whom he admired immensely, is wrong about X or Y, I mean, to me, that just says that Wilson's a real critic. I mean, what critic is not wrong about this or that or the other, you know? Uh, uh, it's also, you know, it's a way of a writer like Trilling um, expressing proudly his own powers of discrimination. In other words, I like him 85 or 95%, but there's that residue, and if I don't tell you about it, you'll think that I'm completely taken in. I mean, there, it's part of it's, it's an identity issue. You know, uh, I, I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with it only when it, you know, it it's, comes out of nowhere and it's unnecessary and it's not necessary to the review or the argument, but. But, you know, by and large, it's also, and this is something that I've often told my students when they have trouble formulating something or getting into the dissertation they're supposed to be writing, I say, see if you can find something you can play off, you know, and, and bounce off something that will allow you to crystallize your own argument. Uh, I, 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 I remember in the book I describe a lecture that I heard Levis give it turned out to be a quite famous essay and, you know, that he gave at the Slavonic Society in Cambridge. And this was very unusual because of his, his sense that literature essentially is made of language. He almost never wrote about any work in translation. But in this case, he allowed the Slavonic Society to uh, convince him to give a public lecture on a book that he loved, Anna Karenina. And I remember vividly, I haven't reread the essay in many years, but I remember vividly sitting there and hearing him at the beginning trying to find something that he could play off of so that he could then develop his own argument. And he quotes some things that Matthew Arnold wrote about Anna Karenina and they didn't work because they weren't significant enough. And then he quotes some things that D.H. Lawrence said about Anna Karenina and that wasn't enough for him to play off of. And then he gets the brilliant idea to play it off. Here's a, a story of a marriage of adultery and so on, Anna Karenina. And he plays it off not against something that Lawrence said or wrote, but against Lawrence's own marriage to Frida Lawrence. And suddenly, I could feel Levis's argument like a helicopter lifting off the pad. 
suddenly he took off and it just went from there once he had something to take off from. And, and to me, that's worth the effort, even worth the offense of uh, unnecessary attack, you know. I have to ask you about another uh, Levis anecdote in the book. It's about Little Dorrit. Uh, with, you know, he was famously at, uh, attacked Dick, Dickens and dismissed, I think, everything except hard times at one point, and then he later rescinded. Well, he didn't rescind it. He just wrote another book saying that Dickens was great. But you, uh, and I think it was you and a few students, uh, convinced him to do Little Dart. And I think the first two times he attempted to speak on it, he completely uh, fumbled. Well, he, as I say, he worked by bringing in passages. So he'd bring in these passages and he'd read them aloud or distribute them. And again, it was a little bit like trilling, waiting for inspiration. It just didn't take off. And then he asked if he could do it again and it didn't take off. And then he asked if he could do it one more time. And then it took off. You know, it's, 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 it's almost like the descent of grace, you know? It's like, uh, uh, I mean, plenty of critics or other kinds of writers can work quite mechanically. They can sit down with a text and they can just, you know, sort of work, on, work it out. But these critics were almost, were, were really looking for inspiration. And uh, uh, the thing about Levis, of course, I, I think the real problem with him is that, not that people said he never changed his mind, but he did change his mind, but he could never admit that he changed his mind. <laughs> So he, he went 360, he went 180 degrees on Dickens, but could never acknowledge that he had changed his mind about Dickens, because that would have acknowledged that he was once wrong. Well, uh, Forster, E.M. Forster, he went the other direction, and you, t you talk about, uh, I think you're in the classroom, and you quoted him right. to his face from when he, when he liked Forster. And he just laughed at it. <laughs> I, I was wondering what his response, you, you say he was amused, but I wondered if he had said anything. Right, right. I mean, it was, not, it was not a classroom, it was a, a public lecture. Uh, one of his students was giving a talk and he, and he, from the audience, Levis slammed into Forster and I, I remember it, what he had written about Forster and, and you know, this was child's play to him that I could quote him against him, you know, but again, something I would never have done later, but at, you know, at, at, as a student I could, you know, I was perfectly happy to take on anyone. Well, I'm going to quote you against you only to the degree that when you went to see Francois Truffaut, you stood up and asked him a question, and that will be a cue for anybody who will, I think we can take a few questions. There are microphones on either side, and uh, anybody who I'm wants to. I'm sorry we can't have Francois Truffaut here to, to well, answer them. Uh, but but uh, let me ask you, there's a, there's a leitmotif that's running throughout the book, um, about uh, therapy and right. anxiety, and it, it isn't quite, uh, there's no solution by the end of the book. I'm no. just wondering. Well, when the book ends, I'm still in psychotherapy, and I'm still working on things and so on. Um, Is there a volume two in mind? I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, I don't think there's, you know, there should be a volume two, partly because it's really the formative years that interest me most with almost any life, you know. I remember, uh, you know, when Arnold Rampersad was working on his, uh, his big two-volume biography of, of Langston Hughes, and he had published the first volume, and he said that he was concerned that those perhaps were the really interesting years, and that uh, he, didn't, he was a little concerned about what the second volume would be like. And I said, well, in the case of an author like Langston Hughes, the first volume is about the formation of the personality and the work and the, you know, whereas once he becomes famous, then it's about the culture, the biography is more about the culture around him. And, uh, but I think I've already written about the culture around me and to, enough and I, I don't, I don't when, really. When you uh, look back at the, the writers that you wrote about and the ones who were important, um, I wonder if you have uh, second readings and, and how you feel about I, I, For example, I used to love Donald Bartlemy and I bought every one of his books and didn't look at them for years and then pulled them off the shelf, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago and was amazed at how funny they weren't at, mm -hmm. at books that made me laugh out loud. Um, and when I was teaching a course here about post-war American culture, 
Uh, I was astonished that nobody in the class had ever heard of Bernard Malamud. We did the assistant. They were very moved by it. But a lot of the writers that we sort of thought were the modern classics really aren't known. But one of the fascinating things about it is, well, not simply that they are unknown, I mean, but, but the way books, for you yourself, for, for any reader, books change as you change and, books, and as time goes on. I mean, uh, Wendy Lesser wrote a fascinating book about rereading in her 50s books that she'd fallen in love with in her 20s. And the title of the book is called, is Nothing Remains the Same. And, uh, and it's, tr it's, it's always very interesting because when you go back, it's a little bit like writing the memoir. Not only you discover who you were then, but how you became what you became. And I think when you read books from a different vantage point, uh, uh, they change and you're not, you're not quite sure how much they've changed and how much you've changed. I mean, I once uh, introduced John Updike at a reading at the Y, and after his dinner afterwards, he said that he said that uh, he thought that in his fiction, and that, that by that point he published many, many, many volumes, he thought that he had used up every single iota of personal experience that he'd ever had and that he was out of, out of it. He said, and then I got older, and then I got old, and some of the things that I'd already written about looked very different from, to me from the, from the vantage point of old age. So essentially, he got a second bite of the apple, and I think that rereading works like that. I mean, uh, I think part of it, with someone like Bartholomew uh, and other writers of the 60s, what is most striking is the novelty. And once you no longer have that novelty, and that's true for almost all experimental work, then it possibly can go flat for you, or, or not. I mean, who would have thought when I was a student, uh, the two really hot playwrights from abroad were Beckett and Ionesco? And I would not have guessed that Beckett has aged extremely well. And Ionesco, though I haven't seen any of his plays for a while, I suspect it's not aged very well. Uh, why that is, I, I don't know. There's something, there's something, maybe something deeper, more timeless in Beckett, which is not mere novelty as it might have been in the UNESCO. Uh, I think you quote Bloom as, as singling him out as the one great writer alive or something, or maybe it's not you, but somewhere I read that Bloom said that. About? About Beckett. About Beckett. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the, the incredible rigor that made his work smaller and smaller and smaller, like a kind of Giacometti sculpture, and that ultimately led to a kind of silence. Uh, I mean, that... Of course, yeah. Updike despised him, I think, probably for that. Updike is... I'm sorry. Updike despised Beckett. He wrote a... Did he really? I didn't know that. He wrote a really negative review in The New Yorker about uh, how it is. He parodied it. He, he just couldn't even take it seriously as, so. as a work of fiction. I didn't know that Beckett ever got a negative review. <laughs> well, on that note, I actually said something you didn't know. I'm, I, I want to thank you. This was such a pleasure for me. Thank you, thank you for coming. You, are we taking questions or? There, there were no, oh, there's a question. May I ask a question? Um, uh, who knew when, when, when I came here that you'd spent two thirds of your time talking about F.R. Levis? Uh, a great surprise, but I enjoyed it. But it, uh, in case you didn't notice, you have a different reaction to Levis. You think he's cantankerous, and you think it's great that somebody had so much emotional right. involvement yeah. in his material. That's and a good summary of our difference. <laughs> And, and you said if there's a problem, it's that people don't have that now. That okay. they're, and you even say that you're more de detached and less likely to be that way. Is, it, is, is all the discussion you've had point out a tremendous cultural shift? You work with students currently. Do you find that these experiences that you've been describing, and certainly F.R. Levis, are very detached from people today? And how do you... How do you deal with that, and how do you, how do you respond to that, if it's true? 
Well, you know, things change. I mean, I, you can't, I mean, it's, it's become almost a cliche for people who came of age in the 60s to be disappointed in their students and to think, oh, you, you guys are just not as hip as we were as our generation. I mean, uh, it's, um, uh, it's almost a miracle that something that uh, you were impassioned about, uh, you know, when you were young, continues to be exciting to people who are young 20, 30, 40 years later. I think that, that that's something, Trilling, for example, was very disapproving of my generation of students because he felt that they didn't really see the, didn't really feel the impact of the modern writers that they had had on him, the impact that they'd had him in, his, in the 20s and 30s. And he didn't understand that, that, 20 year, that 40 years later, reading Beckett, reading Kafka, reading Joyce and Proust was as shocking to us at the age of 19 as they had been to him at the age of 19. Uh, now, that's not true for everyone. Uh, some writers are shocking and then they're assimilated or they're forgotten and so on and so forth. So I, you know, uh, it, 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 saddens, it saddens me if I have students who have never heard of Bernard Malamud, but I can't say that it really surprises me. Is it, but is it very much true that they have, they're very much less involved in both Proust and those writers and even recent writers, Malamud, is that your experience? I, I find that student, my students are interested in a lot of writers that I'm not interested in. They're interested in writers that I am interested in. Uh, I don't think, you know, uh, one anecdote about Trilling that I didn't, that's not in the book. Uh, I remember hearing him say that friends, students recommended this or that wonderful writer to him, a uh, new writer. And he said, yes, 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 sounds very interesting. And I really should take the time to go out and read this first novel by so-and-so. But then I think to myself, gee, wouldn't I rather spend that time rereading The Red and the Black? And here, at, at, here I'm, I'm in my mid-twenties and I think, God, if I ever just want to reread Stendhal rather than read some new writer, I'll commit suicide. That would, be, that would be the fate worse than death, right? You know, you're just stuck in the old groove, right? Well, you get older and you get older and I find sometimes I think, well, you know, I would rather reread that novel by Saul Bellow than read, you know, and I find that, you know, that whether I'm revisiting my early experience or, you know, or something that I know I'm going to really like and enjoy, uh, you know, that's the way it is. <laughs> All right, thank you. Sir, I, oh, one more. Thank you. I, you are so many good questions. I, I, I don't want to ask a long question. May I ask my dear colleague and uh, wonderful human being? This is Professor. You Taylor. have one of the most critical, sharp-minded, analytical mind. When you write about your own life, what do you do with your sharp, critical mind? Are you critic of your book you are writing? Or uh, can you keep, create a distance? Oh, I'm writing about Goldstein, I mean, eh? myself, but I have to assume so-called objective perspective. So, is there any diff well, thank you, difference? Well, I, I, You as a writer, also as a... If I were able to bring to bear the same objectivity to my own life as I hope I can do to certain works of fiction or poetry, I'd be a freak. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I really, you know, in writing this, I really strove, I think, for honesty rather than for objectivity. And, you know, and to even take. honesty is unavailable when you're dealing with your own experience. But, you know, you try. Uh, uh, 
I, I think it, you know, I think it probably comes from a slightly different corner of the brain from yeah. more pro other professional kinds of writing, but you know, uh, there it is. I, 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 it would be for other people to judge rather than me. But thank you for the question. That's why we admire you. Last one. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, I have a, a triangle of mine, and that is uh, yourself, John Keats, and Lionel Trilling. And uh, Trilling, you know, I had, uh, you know, the uh, his very well-known essay on uh, Keats in his, in his letters, and he had, that was first published as a, you know, uh, a as an introduction to uh, Keats's uh, Keats's letters, and right. it became it was republished in the Opposing Self, and it's been republished right. since. And uh, here you were at, uh, you know, Columbia then, you know, later on after your undergraduate career, well, you know, years after, and, you know, you, you, uh, a, you had the dissertation and then the, you know, then the book, you know, on, on John Keats and, uh, and Trilling, uh, you know, never, never saw really to, uh, he kept on putting it off and he said he had it and then, you know, and then it turned into a book and then you, you know, then you, you had the, uh, you know, the, the tenure proceedings and everything like that and I gather from your fascinating narrative that, you know, he was less than, you know, really uh, enthusiastic in, in, you know, in that particular context too and he never had read, you know, read the book and I was wondering, you know, because you, know, you introduce all the, the issues about you know the you know uh, the '68 and the political uh, you know political a uh, a protests and things like that and you clearly had you know been uh, more involved you know as a in a populist kind of sense pro student I think than you know f uh, figures like Trilling and Barzin and stuff so I was wondering you know in his refusal and in his you know kind of diffidence and tepid kind of uh, you know remarks during the tenure proceedings was do you think Looking back, there were some, you know, political implications there, and uh, that, you know, in other words, that he was, uh, you know, was a, a kind of a, a discriminating in, in a political sense. Well, Trilling was not a good mentor, in part because his stock and trade as a critic, and I think probably as a person, was ambivalence. And. Uh, I mentioned, I think I mentioned, maybe not in this book, but elsewhere, that he had a problem giving his stamp of approval to anything because his stamp of approval would then have identified him and fixed him. Uh, and, you know, I, I've read letters by writers, Saul Bellow, uh, John O'Hara, who were driven crazy by the fact that Trilling seemed to like their work in one moment. On the other hand, he didn't like their work, that he had reservations and so on. I've sometimes attributed it to the, the Groucho Marx statement that he didn't, he wouldn't join any club that would have someone like him for a member. Uh, he didn't want to be stamped by, I mean, the mistake that I made with Trilling in my thesis was, I said that one of my readers at Yale, uh, readers of the thesis, had said that it was somewhat Trilling-esque. And once he heard that he might have influenced it, he was unable to read it because he then would have seen his own reflection mirrored in somebody else's work. And so, I mean, I, I could understand it, but of course it was painful to me that someone whom I usually admired could not get himself to read at least that uh, uh, work of his. Later, I, I think he did read other stuff of mine. And, one of my last encounters with him, he mentioned some essay I'd had in Partisan Review and said, oh, we must get together sometime and talk about it. And of course, as with always with him, that never happened. So, uh, but, but uh, you know, this is completely irrelevant, but la years later when I met Alfred Kazin, and Kazin was just the opposite. If Trilling was ambivalent about any, ever, anything, Alfred Kazin was incandescent and enthusiastic about everything. And I, uh, it's one of the few friendships in my life that developed from a book review. I had reviewed one of Kazin's books, a book that other people didn't like as much and that I liked very much. And I was just embraced by him in this huge, you know, uh, burst of friendship and so on, which continued through the next 14, 15 years of his life. And 
I finally came to realize that if I had to type them, that he was like the good father, <laughs> and that Trilling was the bad father, the abusive father. And so I had the benefit of both good parenting and, uh, and painfully unpleasant parenting as well. So, Thank you. <laughs>